Hello. I'm, I'm Kristen Nevius, Director of the Marlin Fitzwater Center for Communication, and it is my privilege to welcome you to the studios of the Marlin Fitzwater Center for Communication at Franklin Pierce University in Ringe, New Hampshire. We in the Fitzwater Center believe that democracy does not just happen. It requires commitment to informed decision making at the polls. We are very pleased to be here today with young students who are going into the next election not only as first-time voters but also as young journalists. They and their teachers have made that commitment to the robust political discourse that is so essential to our nation's democracy. And also with us is someone who has lived that commitment, covering six presidents from the White House for several networks before retiring in 2014 from CBS Radio. Peter Mayer knew from the age of eight that he wanted to be a reporter. He started off at the local radio station in high school and quickly gained traction from there. He got his big break at, in the news when he was assigned to cover Jimmy Carter's presidential transition in 1976. And in the decades since, journalism has changed in many ways. But what hasn't changed is the importance of free speech uh, and a free press in our democracy. Please join me in welcoming Peter Mayer to the podium to talk to us about the future of journalism. Well, thank you, Kristen. I appreciate that. Uh, I was beyond flattered when my friend Marlon Fitzwater asked me to be part of this terrific program, and I look forward to uh, learning with you and, I have to say, from you over the next few days. I want to congratulate all of you uh, and your parents and your teachers uh, for getting you uh, to this point. I also want to do a little preview and tell you uh, how excited I am to be reunited and working with Bruce Zanka, who is sitting here, and will tell you about his career, and he and I are looking forward to uh, what I think is just a great title for a program, Rules of Engagement, when we talk to you in the coming days about the relationship between reporters and the press office at the White House and, and the president, uh, him or herself. And Bruce uh, served so ably in the White House, and he'll tell you about that. And I can't wait to learn from uh, great faculty members uh, here at Franklin Pierce. And I'm told that I'm going to receive, and Bruce, you are too, a medallion bearing Marlon Fitzwater's likeness. And that is so perfect because to me, uh, I've always told audiences that Marlon uh, is and was the gold standard uh, for White House press secretaries. As Kristen said, I covered six presidents uh, and their press secretaries. There, was a lot, there were a lot more than six press secretaries because uh, some presidents uh, had more than one. Marlin, of course, uh, was among the very best in the history of the job, um, and he was and is a firm believer in the public's right to know. He, uh, among all the press secretaries, there were only a couple who knew exactly how to strike the right balance between rock-solid allegiance to the boss, the person in the Oval Office, in his case, two presidents. He was the only one who served two presidents, Presidents Reagan and George H.W. Bush, and the balance between the allegiance to the boss and the public's right to know. When Marlin spoke from the White House podium, the reporters sitting there and the people watching uh, or hearing about it at the time, because the briefings weren't always televised in, in that era, they knew they could take it to the bank with what Marlon Fitzwater told them. Um, in my years of covering the White House, I learned that there are two types of press secretaries. Uh, there are the press secretaries who are the true communications advisors to presidents, and they advise the presidents on communication strategy, they speak to the closest aides to the president, the people in the inner circle, and, and talk to them about the messaging. And they have access to the Oval Office. And good reporters know who has access to the Oval Office, or say, the mayor's office, or the governor's office, when it comes to people who are spokespeople for them. Uh, presidents seek and listen to their messaging, uh, to their guidance on messaging, and Marlin defined that category. Now, the other type of press secretary, I call that the mouthpiece. Mouthpieces get their talking points from the president or maybe not even the president, maybe the communications director or someone below the president. Um, they have little or no direct access to the president. 
Uh, they are the press secretaries who reporters can see are unable to answer a lot of questions uh, at briefings or even in casual encounters. Uh, they're often forced to admit or have to admit that they haven't even discussed a certain issue or uh, idea with the president. So again, Marlin defines the person who really was, again, the gold standard of the presidency when it comes to press secretaries, and he sends his best to all of you. I've been in touch with him over the past few days, and he asked me to share a couple of thoughts. Now, despite all the criticism being leveled uh, at the news media these days, Marlin asked me to tell you that he firmly believes that most journalism being practiced today is still what he calls old-fashioned reporting of the facts. He also asked me to tell you that the most uh, special and fascinating aspects of journalism are, in his words, quote, seeing the world, asking questions, and meeting new people. I want to thank uh, Kristen for that uh, nice introduction and for mentioning a couple of my career highlights. I did have some wonderful and inspiring assignments over the years. I saw every president going back to John F. Kennedy, who visited my hometown in, in Illinois when I was just in the eighth grade. And I met all the presidents from Gerald Ford to President Obama. But I try to keep it all in perspective by remembering a favorite story that's been passed down by White House reporters through the years. Um, it seems that a correspondent was aboard Air Force One flying with President John F. Kennedy. And they got into a conversation. And he said, Mr. President, what would happen if this plane went down right now? What would happen if it crashed? And Kennedy reportedly said to him, well, I know one thing you'd just be a footnote. That little story kind of uh, drives home a lesson, lesson for aspiring reporters, and uh, that is don't let yourselves become part of the story. But sometimes it's unavoidable. Um, I unwillingly became involved in a stories a few times over the years, some funny, not so funny. Uh, back in 1988, that seems like the dark ages probably to many in this room, um, I was with President Ronald Reagan when he traveled to the Soviet Union, the place that he called, who knows, the evil empire. Uh, I was on Air Force One. Uh, the president had made a stop in uh, Helsinki for uh, a, a brief uh, set of meetings, and then we flew on to Moscow. And uh, I was on the Air Force One pool. Now, the pool is a group of about 11 or 12 reporters uh, representing each type of the media. They're radio correspondents, TV correspondents, the wires, the newspapers, magazines at the time, and then, of course, the photographers and the TV camera people. Uh, and they sit again in the back of Air Force One, right next to the galley, so we always got a, a good preview of, uh, of what the food was going to be, but we were always, rightfully so, the, the last to be served. But you're all, always on the alert for a presidential visit or the press secretary or some other top person who's on the flight to come back and, and brief you. On the ground, the pool rides in the presidential motorcades and uh, covers what are called tight pool settings uh, where the space is limited. And their job is to report back to all the other reporters whatever happens. Uh, so shortly after we arrived in Moscow that day, uh, President and Mrs. Reagan uh, were scheduled and, and decided they wanted to take a stroll through a pedestrian market, uh, a place known as the Arbot. Uh, now keep in mind this was still in, uh, you know, very strict communist times in, in Russia or in the Soviet Union. And as Marlin revealed in his fine book called Call the Briefing, which I would commend to all of you, and I think uh, Bruce and I will talk a little bit more about when we discuss rules of engagement, uh, as he revealed in this book, the Secret Service was very much opposed to the Reagans taking this walk because the area was too open. But they insisted that they wanted to see and be seen on President Reagan's very first trip to Moscow. So the pool always stays very close to the president as possible to uh, record any comments, anything that might happen, and really as indelicate uh, as this may seem to stand death watch in the uh, worst case scenario involving the safety of the commander in chief. Now the Soviet security police just didn't know what to do with us. They, they couldn't handle the situation. Um, after all, they, they were not used to seeing a group of reporters so close to uh, a visiting president of the United States, let alone close to one of their leaders because of course there it was state-controlled media at the time. So it was sheer chaos, pandemonium, as the, uh, the Russian guards 
uh, indiscriminately shoved anyone to the side as the Reagans walked along the street in this, this shopping area. So one of these uh, Russian goons picked me up and threw me tr partially over a chained barricade uh, and my uh, trousers were torn and I got uh, pretty bruised on my legs and on my side. So the print pooler, the, the newspaper reporter, was assigned to write a description of this for everyone else to read. And it was my job to tell the fellow broadcasters. And uh, his written pool report, uh, as printed in Marlin's book called The Briefing, I'd kind of forgotten about some of this, said, quote, reporter Peter Mayer was punched and said he felt sick afterwards. Uh, by the way, I was mostly sick because I lost some of my company's equipment when this guy tossed me over the chain in the, in the craziness of the day. But because I was a witness or maybe a victim of the scene, uh, I reluctantly became part of the story. And I, again, had to share all the details with the, the other reporters who are stationed back in what is called the filing center uh, in another part of town. On a much lighter note, I, I became part of the story at the White House in the Bill Clinton years. Um, I arrived at the White House every day for about 20 years shortly before 6 a.m. Uh, because I did the morning radio reports for CBS News, what we call morning drive for an obvious reason. And I was often the first person into the, uh, the press area. So one morning I came in and I opened the door into the, the briefing room where you see the, the White House press secretary do the briefings. And I was startled to see, you ready for this? A huge rat running across the camera platform where all the TV cameras are, are set. Uh, scared the daylights out of me. Think of it, this rat in the very room where the president held news conferences and the daily White House briefing is conducted. Well, uh, the incident came up at the White House press briefing that day. And President Clinton's fine spokesman, uh, Mike McCurry, who, by the way, is, is right up on the same echelon as, as Marlin when it comes to being a, a great press secretary. McCurry declared, quote, dirty rats among the White House press corps, nothing new. Uh, he opened the briefing by announcing that government workers would trap and exterminate the rodent, and by the way, they did. There was also a lot of joking about uh, two-legged and four-legged uh, inhabitants of the White House press briefing room. Now, you know, I'm not bragging, but you can Google my name. I did it the other day. You can Google my name and briefing room rat, and uh, that story uh, will come up uh, in, uh, in uh, due time, that's for sure. Um, so these were, you know, some great adventures, but much of the time of a White House correspondent uh, is really devoted to studying, to researching. You're almost like a firefighter. Uh, if you compare it to being a doctor, you're a general practitioner. One day you might be uh, discussing something like the economy. The next day it could be war. Uh, the next day um, it could be education. Uh, I always said that the White House is the beat of last resort and first resort when it comes to assignment editors because uh, they just felt that, that everything demanded uh, a reaction from the White House, rightfully so. Um, long before these sometimes crazy adventures and, and witnessing so much history, um, as I thought about this day, I, I want you to know I was right where you are now. Um, as Kristen said, I started thinking about being a reporter, and I don't know why, when I was eight years old, uh, I was lucky enough to be editor-in-chief of my high school newspaper in my small town, hometown in Illinois. Um, in between my junior and senior years in high school, I was so lucky to attend a program exactly like this, but I don't think as I look at the curriculum that you all are going to have over the next few days is good, but it was at Michigan State University at their journalism school. Uh, that same year, between my junior and senior years, I was lucky enough to land my first broadcast job, hosting a high school news show on the, uh, the small radio station in my hometown. And I worked in radio from that point until I retired uh, two years ago. Through the years, my hometown, a place called Granite City, Illinois, was really the anchor for my news stories. I always asked myself to try to put a story in perspective, no matter what it was that the president was doing, I'd try to think, what would the people back in Granite City want to know about this? And I think, you know, that, that it served me well in all modesty, and I hope that you all will keep your hometown roots here in New Hampshire, 
or wherever you call home in mind as a, as a barometer for, for what really belongs in your stories. And you won't get into, uh, if you're in Washington, the what we call the inside the beltway mentality that, uh, that so many people fall into. It's always great to be back here in New Hampshire. Um, the scene of some of my favorite uh, reporting experiences. I did every primary from uh, 1980 until, oh boy, just, uh, what, 2012 maybe, something like that. Um, and a lot of them, you know, these experiences, of course, happened in snowy winters in presidential primary years here. This is the first time I've ever been to New Hampshire when it wasn't winter. Uh, I actually did my first live satellite feed from New Hampshire. Uh, this happened in the early 1980s, I guess 84 when I was here for the primary, and the radio network that I worked for at the time uh, excitedly called me and said they wanted me to head to a satellite truck in the parking lot of the old Sheraton Wayfarer Hotel in Manchester. Now this was the middle of the night, and I don't need to tell you what the weather was, wind blown snow, and I could hardly, there was hard, very little visibility, and I pulled up in my rental car, and sure enough, there was a, a satellite truck, uh, one of these bulky trucks with a big satellite dish on the top, and I climbed up and knocked on the window of the cab. I think I woke the guy up uh, and identified myself, and he rolled down the window and shoved a broom out to me. And he said, climb up on top of the truck, brush off the dish, and then you can come in here and go on the air get the snow off the, the satellite dish. Uh, that was my low-tech introduction to satellite broadcasting. Uh, New Hampshire adventure number two. Uh, I'd been all, all day, out all day covering uh, one of the, the primaries, and I returned to my hotel in uh, Concord at about 2 a.m. And uh, that this was uh, election night, and, and the returns had come in, and I slid my key into the, uh, the slot in the door and I noticed that there was a Washington Redskins gym bag on the floor, and it wasn't mine. And I flipped on the, the light, and there was a man in the bed that I'd slept in the night before. He discovered me too and proclaimed, Secret Service, what the blank are you doing in here? And I said, well, sorry, wrong room, and I uh, backed out of the, uh, the door as quickly as I could, and I noticed that he was reaching for something on the nightstand. I don't know whether it was his gun or his badge, uh, I ran to the front desk, and the, the desk clerk said, oh, we, we tried to reach you all day. Uh, this was the only adjoining room in the hotel, and there's a presidential candidate in the next room, and that guy is a, a Secret Service agent. Uh, this was long before cell phones, so I don't know how they were trying to, to reach me, but I just remember saying to the guy, uh, you know, I could have been shot thanks to you. Uh, the moral of the story, and my wife will confirm that uh, whenever I go into a hotel room, I always take a peek before I walk all the way in. Uh, more than anything, though, seriously, when I think of this, this great state, I think of all the informed and uh, interested and interesting voters I met through the years. Uh, they were, you know, just so important to my stories, and, and they, they always will be. Uh, this evening, I'd like to discuss the, the theme of the Fitzwater program, the presidency and the press, and also the assigned theme uh, of the future of journalism. Now, here's a disclaimer for you from the get-go. Uh, my opinions that I'm about to share with you uh, are not, I assure you, from any partisan political standpoint. I have been apolitical for so many years. Uh, they stem from being a, a fact-based reporter on the White House beat through those six presidencies. Uh, before I retired uh, in 2015, uh, I never would have shared my opinions, even with a lot of friends. Um, I didn't want to do or say anything that would raise questions about my reporting. In fact, uh, my company, CBS News, and, and for that matter, I myself, had rules against making political donations, putting yard signs out, uh, bumper stickers, anything that would have to do with partisan politics. So. Again, what I'm going to tell you is just based on my experience as a reporter and a profound, profound, profound respect for the office of the presidency. Um, I got to cover presidential decisions to go to war, to make peace, good and bad economic times, uh, countless campaigns, presidential trips to more than 50 countries, nearly every state in the Union, initiatives on every conceivable subject from uh, energy to health care and sadly national crises, including an assassination attempt the day President Reagan was shot, uh, an impeachment, 
and the worst terror attack on our country. Uh, so that broad perspective is really the, the basis for my deep concern about the current conflict between the White House and the media. Uh, from the earliest days in the nation's history, as I think you all know, uh, there's been this traditional tension, uh, hopefully uh, a, a uh, healthy push and pull between presidents and the journalists who cover them. Uh, the historians at uh, George Washington's Mount Vernon uh, will note and note online uh, how he was glorified when he took office, but by the end of his first term, he was attacked in the papers of the day. Our third president, Thomas Jefferson, famously said, uh, were it left to me to decide whether we should have a government without newspapers or newspapers without government, I should not hesitate a moment to prefer the latter. Uh, we have heard that quote repeated again and again in recent weeks and months. Uh, but facing harsh criticism before he took office, Thomas Jefferson said, nothing can now be believed which is seen in a newspaper. How's that for an early take on fake news? Uh, Abraham Lincoln faced a very critical press. And, and uh, if you go to the Lincoln Museum in Springfield, Illinois, uh, some of the ugliest editorial cartoons in history are on the wall there with caricatures of the 16th president. History shows us that presidents who master the media trends of their day often enjoy the most success. Franklin Roosevelt was the first president to tap into the only broadcast media uh, medium of that day, radio. Uh, you can listen to recordings of his fireside chats and hear and learn how he connected with the nation one listener at a time, especially during the dark days of World War II. President Kennedy was the first to really take advantage of TV. He had legendary news conferences and, and uh, his speeches uh, displayed a lot of humor when appropriate and directness uh, when required in his short time in office. Fast forward to President Reagan. Uh, he truly was the great communicator. His skills were rooted in an early radio career and his years uh, as a Hollywood uh, movie and TV actor he really knew how to use the broadcast media. Uh, he had the voice, he had the gestures, he had the eye contact, the warmth and the sense of timing. Um, I'm gonna commend two of my favorite Reagan speeches uh, to you. Uh, you can read or just go on YouTube and, and watch the remarks that he delivered in 1986 after the shuttle Challenger disaster. He so eloquently uh, eulogized the lost astronauts while consoling the, uh, the shocked nation at the time. And then I covered uh, that speech and his stirring address June 6th, 1984 at Normandy on the 40th anniversary of D-Day. I have to tell you, Reagan's media team wrote the book on advancing and staging presidential events, the right lighting, the right backdrops, the right audience. Well, that day they really outdid themselves in Normandy. Uh, he spoke surrounded by aging army veterans who had scaled the, the cliffs of Normandy at a place called Pointe du Hoc. Um, there were very, very few dry eyes as he motioned to uh, what he described as the boys, the heroes who helped end the war. Uh, and that's what unfolded that day and it's uh, remembered uh, to this day as one of the great presidential speeches. Um, Looking ahead, Bill Clinton, I think, was probably the first pop culture president. As a candidate, he played his saxophone on, on late night TV, and uh, he appeared on, on MTV. Before then, I don't think any president would have considered uh, you know, those kinds of appearances. The first White House website was launched when Bill Clinton was president. Very different from, from the websites that we see today because things just hadn't advanced that much. Like Reagan, uh, Bill Clinton knew how to uh, connect with audiences uh, in person and on TV. President Obama was the first president to fully embl embrace uh, social media. Uh, it started uh, with his first campaign. I watched his staff and his volunteers uh, use social media. And just the simple thing of asking people at every rally for their emails uh, to build a database in the earliest caucuses in Iowa and of course the primaries here in your state. And then he refined that process, he and the people around him when, when he ran for re-election. Uh, President Obama had the first Twitter account, but he used his link to 55 million Twitter followers, mainly to announce initiatives and other issues. I, I could be wrong, but I can't recall him ever using it to 
single out people or, or groups to uh, attack uh, them or criticize them. Every president that I covered has tried to go around Washington reporters, but Mr. Obama was the very first to do it on social media. He did interviews with online sources that were not part of the traditional White House media core. Um, he opened the presidency and the political process to an entirely new generation, uh, your generation at the time, when it came to communicating through social media. And I might say uh, to the dismay of a lot of uh, old line White House reporters like myself who uh, felt you know, the, uh, the story slipping away from them at times when he did that. Now that brings me to the current commander in tweet. Uh, Twitter is Donald Trump's unfiltered system, as we know, to communicate directly to his millions of followers and others who uh, hear about his tweets almost uh, immediately as they're posted and they're picked up by the news media and put on the air and online. Um, we've heard him recently defend his harsh tone, the harsh tone of, of uh, these attack tweets of his, saying that it's modern presidential communication. I've heard from Trump supporters who say that reporters should uh, spend less time, and in fact, some of Trump's detractors who say that reporters should spend uh, less time on relaying his tweets and more time covering the issues. But when the White House itself uh, says that it views those tweets as official presidential statements, there is no ignoring them. He is the President of the United States, and this is the vehicle that he's chosen to communicate with the country, for better or worse, those 140 character uh, Trump blasts reveal a lot about his mindset. Uh, writing in the Washington Post just last week, uh, columnist Michael Gerson said, uh, we cannot look away from Trump's tweets. Gerson is a conservative, a respected conservative thinker. He was President George W. Bush's chief speech writer, and he is warning that rather than a new age in presidential communications, as Trump claims, uh, we are witnessing what uh, Gerson described as an ongoing public breakdown. Relations between a modern president and reporters who cover him have never been as strained as they are now. Uh, Trump has attacked reporters individually and as a group, along with uh, labeling much reporting that he doesn't like as fake news. Uh, he has made fun of the physical appearance of, of journalists, including a disabled reporter, um, and he has uh, taken on the, uh, the, the, the physical appearances of, of women TV anchors and reporters. Most troubling to me uh, was the February 17th tweet, uh, where he listed what he described as the failing New York Times, NBC News, ABC, CBS, and CNN as the enemy of the American people. Think about that, the free press as the enemy. Uh, the factual stories that Donald Trump does not like are not fake news. Um, as my friend, retired CBS News Chief Washington Correspondent Bob Schieffer has noted, those who undermine the role of the press undermine the foundation of the country. And I personally believe a lot of what we have been seeing over the past months demeans the office of the presidency itself. Now don't get me wrong, reporters and their publications and their networks must be called to account when mistakes are, are made or if their objectivity slips. That's why newspapers have correction pages and that's why uh, broadcast uh, networks and, and stations have uh, parts of their programming where they try to correct the record. Earlier this year, as, as he received an award, uh, Washington Post editor Martin Barron, uh, who of course was also very famous with his work at the, uh, the Boston Globe, uh, Mr. Barron emphasized principles set by a former Post publisher, uh, Eugene Meyer. The first mission of newspapers is to tell the truth as nearly as the truth may be ascertained. So what should White House reporters do in the, uh, the face of the, uh, the current atmosphere? I personally think, from having been on the job for a, a few years, uh, that they should do their job, they should report the facts, they should not allow themselves to be the opposition as they've been labeled by, by this White House because they are not the opposition. And that is the challenge for all of you, whether you're covering news at your high school uh, or your future assignments that can take you from the county courthouse to the White House. Uh, in sharp contrast to the current ugly atmosphere, I was remembering the other day uh, President George H.W. Bush's response 
when the media got on his nerves. Uh, during the 1992 campaign, when he was running for re-election, uh, Mr. Bush closed almost every speech by urging crowds to annoy the media, re-elect Bush. Uh, note, he said, annoy, not destroy the media. By the way, Mr. Bush became very concerned and upset uh, when some of his overzealous reporters tried to whack some of us who were uh, traveling on, the, tried to whack us on the head with campaign signs as we came in and out of his rallies. So then he added, because he's such a considerate guy, he added a line saying, I'm not talking about these guys who travel with me, I'm talking about those talking heads back in Washington. Uh, those talking heads, by the way, <laughs> continued to annoy George H.W. Bush long after he left office. Uh, I was treated to it firsthand many years later uh, when I visited uh, with him at his presidential library in College Station, Texas. Uh, I was there covering President Obama, and he was there to salute our 41st president uh, in 2009. So I was very flattered. The, I was invited to the Bush's apartment there on the, the campus of Texas A&M, adjacent to the library, to, to visit with them. Um, I was one of the only guys still left on the beat who had covered him. Uh, so at his request, he said, did you bring your recorder? I said, yeah, well, let, let's do a little interview. Okay. So with my recorder running, he decided to go after a couple of liberal TV commentators who had been frequent critics of uh, the previous president, his son, George W. Bush. Uh, the first President Bush in the course of this interview said, uh, I don't want to mention any names, but... Uh, I think uh, Keith Olbermann and Rachel Maddow on MSNBC are, as he put it, a couple of sick puppies. Barbara Bush was sitting nearby, and in a stage whisper, she said, George, you just mentioned their names. <laughs> well, this was a priceless moment and a darn good story for me. You should have seen the ears perk up when I went back into this big filing center and started sending this this uh, this sound of, of President Bush into my office, and every all the other reporters could hear it. Uh, it also reminded me of why George H.W. Bush and uh, former First Lady Barbara are two of the favorite White House occupants that I had the honor of covering. Uh, they are uh, the real deal. Uh, as we have an opportunity to visit here at the Fitzwater Center over the next uh, few days, I hope that each of you will wrap yourselves around the fact that you are living in a media, communications, information revolution. It started with the internet. Um, it's as important as the advent of the print, printing press so many centuries ago, of radio, TV, electricity, you name it. Uh, you might find it hard to believe, but there are a few people in this room as I look around who remember the world before the web. I won't look at anybody directly as I say that. Um, the internet's popularity and total indispensability flowed, of course, into our social media the uh, popularity and availability of social media along with independent news sites and those that are linked to your newspapers and local TV radio stations uh, are changing the equation. The Pew Research Center uh, found a couple of years ago that only 20% of people 18 to 24 read a daily newspaper, 20%. Uh, people in their 60s are the average viewers of network and cable news. Uh, how many of you, and I know you, you're the exception, how many of you read a daily paper, either hard copy or online? Great, great. Um, the way news is distributed, too, uh, and the way it's received uh, is also at the heart of this, this revolution. There are still thousands of newspapers and magazines with varying circulations around the country. Many, frankly, are struggling to survive, but others have seen a real circulation bump uh, an increase in this era of Donald Trump. Um, as for websites, it would be impossible to count uh, how many are out there. I know some of you uh, have your own websites or your school newspapers do. Uh, so you're very much a part of this new media revolution. Uh, as excited as I am about the ever-increasing number of media choices, I'm also concerned about media illiteracy. And I know that, that you do not fall into that category, but it's the inability of so many people in our country to be able to recognize what's real and what's phony, what's fact and what's opinion, uh, who's a commentator and who's a real honest-to-goodness journalist. How do we differentiate between fact and fake? Well, the solutions are really with each one of us. Uh, we simply must be 
smarter news consumers. I know you're all smart enough to know how to spot fake news uh, spread by people who want to stir up trouble. Uh, there are also people who spread fake news for profit. Uh, you see that on display in the, in, at the grocery store uh, checkouts with the, uh, the tabloid headlines. Just for fun, I uh, looked up and, and I actually remembered a, a few of my favorites. And you also see these online. A lot of websites will direct you to these headlines to get you know, more clicks. Uh, one of my favorites was Dolphin Grows Human Arms. Uh, Dick Cheney is a robot, was one of the, uh, was one of the uh, uh, tabloid headlines. Hillary Clinton adopts alien baby. Uh, that one was posted in one of the wire service, the, the, the windows of one of the wire service booths at the White House for a long time. Uh, and then the one that we saw during this campaign, uh, Ted Cruz's father linked to JFK assassination. Uh, Donald Trump uh, made, folded that in, into to his speaking points when he was uh, uh, competing against uh, Ted Cruz during the campaign. Uh, the News Literacy Project uh, is a valuable effort uh, that is backed by news organizations, and maybe some of your schools have, have used the, the News Literacy Project. Uh, they have a, a lot of pointers to help sort out the real from the, the phony, especially in online news. Uh, they're among what the, the News Literacy Project calls questions for fake news detection. And you can see the entire list uh, at newsliteracyproject.org. And I would say it's a, it's a good thing to look at. Also, we all have to think twice about sharing any item that we, that we see online that raises doubts. That's a good way to stop fake news. It's not worth hitting the forward button. Um, online sources are not the only issue. Consider the way TV news is, is often delivered. And this is really one of my pet peeves. Uh, too often, what they label as breaking news is really broken news. Um, it's things that we already know about. Uh, then there's that other favorite TV uh, and website news banner, developing story. Almost every story is a developing story unless it happens to be an obituary. Um, as the Washington Post Bob Woodward, uh, speaking at this year's White House Correspondents' Dinner said, uh, the impatience and speed of the internet in our own rush can disable and undermine the most important tool of journalism, that luxury of time to inquire, to pursue, to find the real agents of genuine news, witnesses, uh, participants, and, and documents. So often we're in such a hurry to, to beat the deadline clock that a, a lot of things go by the side in, in terms of really being able to put stories into context. Uh, think about it, we've gone from uh, a 24-hour news cycle, which seemed really demanding, to a 24-second news cycle, especially when you have a president who's tweeting all the time. Uh, newspaper reporters once had deadlines based on when their papers went to press. Uh, they would have rolling deadlines over the evening papers, the morning papers. Uh, broadcasters had daily uh, TV, evening news, or hourly radio deadlines. But with today's demands to file uh, for websites, these, these deadlines are constant. They just never stop. I hope and I, and I assume all of you are making an effort to read and listen to and watch all kinds of sources of news from all ends of the uh, political spectrum. I also hope that you'll be good managers of your own social media. Uh, you may have heard this year's ultimate social media horror story. How many of you heard the one about the, the Harvard students? They, uh, I see a lot of heads nodding. Uh, of course, Harvard rescinded its acceptance of 10 students after discovering their offensive posts on a private Facebook messaging page. I recently uh, met uh, two recent college grads at a, at a gathering in Washington, and they told me that uh, an official in their home state decided not to hire someone because of the likes that he clicked on a certain tweet. So you have to think twice about uh, what you do uh, on social media. Count to three or, or maybe even 10 before you post anything on your, on your Facebook page or elsewhere that raises questions. Uh, before we go to questions in a couple of minutes, uh, Marlon Fitzwater advised me uh, that it's very important for me to discuss with you the human side of presidents uh, who I had the, the uh, opportunity to cover. And I thought it was great advice, uh, so I'll do that real quickly. Um, I first saw that side of Jimmy Carter uh, long before he was elected president because, uh, as Kristen mentioned, I covered him for uh, a local radio station uh, when he was governor of Georgia and I was working in Atlanta. 
uh, about two years before the 1976 election, uh, when he was elected to the White House, he invited some state capitol reporters to the Georgia governor's mansion, where the talk turned to his rumored presidential uh, ambitions. Uh, and he didn't deny it. It was so hard for me to believe it at the time that I nearly bit the inside of my cheek off trying to keep from laughing. There's an admission for you. I was so wrong to uh, underestimate Jimmy Carter, and so were many others, including some of his political opponents uh, back in 1976. Uh, as it turned out, my experience covering him was my ticket to Washington. I had mentioned that because so much is, is luck and timing. I was hired by a network that wanted someone on the staff familiar with Jimmy Carter and the people around him. Uh, presidential human side story number two, President Reagan. Um, I, was, uh, I first met him when I was among a small group of White House reporters when I first joined the beat uh, in, in, to cover him, uh, invited to a private reception with, with President Reagan. And to the shock of some of his top assistants, we're sitting there having some drinks and just talking off the record, and President Reagan reached into his ear and proudly pulled out his brand new hearing aid. He wanted to show us the latest in auditory technology at the time. Um, and then he told us the story that he often shared about how he lost his hearing, or his hearing was impaired actually, uh, in, in one of his ears when a blank pistol went off too close to his head when he was shooting uh, a Hollywood movie, filming a Hollywood movie. Now I'd be lying to you if I told you that Ronald Reagan knew my name or the names of many of the other reporters uh, who covered him, but it sure was fun to cover him so much of the time. Uh, he had a great sense of humor uh, that he perfected on what he called the rubber chicken circuit of making speeches uh, across the country before he really got into politics. Uh, he liked to joke about the advantages of being president. Uh, he, he told us, uh, he told many audiences actually, that the day after he took office, he had his high school grades classified as top secret. Um, reporters who traveled with him heard the same joke so many times that we were able to mouth the words <laughs> as he went along. Uh, I've told you, you know, some stories about President George H.W. Bush already. I'd only add that uh, President Bush was always a prolific personal letter writer. Um, I have a file full of wonderful notes uh, received from him over the years. Um, it, it wasn't, you know, that he was trying to win over reporters. It's just really the way he was raised, uh, you know, with, with old fashioned etiquette. Uh, can you imagine a thank you note or a congratulatory note from the President of the United States? And these were handwritten most of the time. Um, I had a, a glimpse of the human side of Bill Clinton very early in his first term. Shortly after he was elected, uh, my wife and I were at the Kennedy Center in Washington, and we noticed there was a little bit of, uh, you know, a, uh, something unusual going on around us. And I looked in the row, and sitting directly behind us was Chelsea Clinton. She must have been, I should know really off the top of my head, eight or nine years old at the time, maybe 10. Um, and she was there to see this show uh, that's called Sheer Madness. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but you, you solve a mystery. Well, when it came time to solve the mystery, Chelsea was waving her arm, trying to get called on by the master of ceremonies, and he never called on her. So I thought, you know, I don't know Bill Clinton at all. I had covered George H.W. Bush during the campaign. This might be an opportunity. So I went to his press secretary and I gave her a note and I said, my wife and I were at the Kennedy Center last night, Mr. President, and we saw your daughter and she was trying to get called on by the Master of Ceremonies and I know exactly how she felt because there are so many times at news conferences <laughs> that I don't get called on. Clinton sent me a handwritten note back on White House stationery and when his press secretary, uh, Dee Dee Myers, the first woman press secretary, by the way, gave me the note, she said, you better hold on to this because Pretty soon, there's not going to be time for him to be writing notes. And the upshot of the note was that Hillary and I have tried our best to give this girl a normal upbringing through his years as governor of Arkansas and then the election to the White House. So that was, you know, a, a real human side of, of, of Bill Clinton uh, that I saw. And, and I also had the opportunity to talk to other first ladies as they came in who were worried about their children and, and the, the, uh, all the attention that they'd get. Uh, the human side of presidents often sadly comes thr through in times of national tragedy, and I think that's what I saw in President Obama as I sat in my CBS radio news seat in the second row of the White House briefing room. 
He made a surprise appearance to discuss the Florida court acquittal of the man who shot and killed uh, an unarmed young black man, as you recall, Trayvon Martin. Uh, I was transfixed. I couldn't take notes because this man, often called no drama Obama, usually kept his emotions in check. But it was, was all I could do to, to keep writing notes because I thought it was just as important to be able to describe to my listeners uh, the emotions of President Obama as he delivered the highly personal and emotional remarks that day. And he famously said, Trayvon Martin could have been me 35 years ago. Uh, but the upshot of it was to, to call for calm and to tell the nation that the jury in the case had spoken. Uh, we also saw Mr. Obama's emotions as he tearfully led the nation in mourning uh, after the Newtown, Connecticut uh, school shootings. Um, I traveled to Newtown with him. It was absolutely uh, gut-wrenching. And then there were the killings at the AME Church in Charleston, South Carolina. Finally, one more personal story. Um, and it happened to me on a trip to China with the first President Bush. The Chinese government, as you know, uh, keeps and kept tight control on uh, the media and on visiting foreigners, especially journalists. Not so much, they don't keep that much control on, on visiting foreigners anymore. Uh, but back then in the 90s, I was taking a break in the hallway outside uh, of the Beijing Hotel Banquet Room where we had our offices during President Bush's visit. Uh, and a nervous looking young bellhop approached me uh, and he said, are you a reporter? And I said, yes, I, I am. He said, are you American? I said, yes, I am. He said, I have a question for you, but I, and he's looking all over the place, he said, but I can't ask you now. Obviously, he was afraid that he was being watched. And he said, if you'll meet me behind this, uh, these elevators at, I don't remember, like 8.30 in the evening, I, I want to ask you a question. Well, I went back to my desk and I thought, what does this guy want? I mean, he, is he, he can't defect to me or uh, I can't tell him any, you know, any state secrets or policy information. So at the appointed time, I met him, and again, he was like nervously looking around to see if anybody was, was monitoring his movements. And then he leaned forward and he whispered in my ear a, a question. Could I tell him who won a boxing bout in the United States? It's, it's so amazing and so profound that he couldn't get that information on his own. And I said, yes, I can get that. And he said, well, I'll meet you tomorrow. And I said, no, I, c I can get that information for you right now. And I went in the other room, picked up a phone, called my office. Well, they told me, you know, Mike Tyson, I think it was Mike Tyson who won. And I told him and he, he just, he couldn't believe it. Easy enough, right? But not for him because his government strictly controlled the flow of information to its people. Simple but profound story. Uh, that incident and visits to so many other countries over the years with our presidents, uh, uh, countries with oppressive governments, reinforced my appreciation and my belief in the freedoms that we enjoy and that we too often take for granted. Uh, you all are living at such an exciting time. I think that uh, it's safe to say that as I look around the room, I'm, I'm confident that uh, you are going to invent new forms of journalism uh, you are going to learn to uh, forge and adapt changes in journalism and the technology of any field you choose, be it journalism or something else. And I hope that many of you will choose to become reporters. Uh, I, I was thinking the other day about a Navy recruiting ad that ran on TV many years ago, and it ended with uh, this slogan with an announcer with a deep voice, Navy, it's not just a job, it's an adventure. And I think that's also so true of the news business. Uh, meanwhile, uh, I have to also say that I think uh, you are also our hope to always work for fairness uh, and to help to lift the national discourse starting in your high schools and when you go on to college. Uh, whether you pursue careers in the media or any other field, I hope that you will fight against, I know you will, racial and ethnic stereotypes, it goes without saying, but I, I want to anyway because it's one of my passions. Um, I made a living asking questions for a lot of years, and now I will be glad to try to answer some of yours. Thank you very much. How are we handling the, the questions?
Wow, no questions? So I got, I, I have one, but <laughs> I, I wanted the students to go first. Um, do I need to be on mic? Or? No, okay. we have mics. Um, and you've been, you've told us some wonderful stories about how personable Reagan is. He was famous for that. You've also told us how um, affected you were by a president of the, of an, of the other party. Both um, Reagan and Obama, um, I guess I have a two-part <coughs> question. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that those affected your coverage of their presidencies? Did it? Uh, did your affection for them, or the fact that you were moved by their stories, by their personality, by their personableness, do you think that colored your reporting in any way? And let me ask the mm -hmm. second part too, and you can mm -hmm. answer both. Mm -hmm. If you were reporting today with the current um, president and its adversarial relationship with the press, could you cover as fairly? I First of all, I didn't have an affection for them. I had, okay. you know, a, a deep respect for, for all the presidents that I that covered or, and a special affection for the office of the, or respect for the office of the presidency. Uh, I don't, you know, I, I like to think that uh, my own reaction uh, to the way they reacted to these uh, situations that I described uh, informed my descriptions on the air, uh, but you know my my personal emotions at the time or personal feelings uh, didn't really come into play. There was just sort of a wow factor uh, to each of those, and and it was my job as a radio reporter to try to convey you know what it was like at Normandy or what it was like in the room when President Obama had you know tears streaming out of his eyes, uh, something that we had never seen before. Um, as for your second question, again, I, I think that uh, the challenge right now is to just do the job. I like to think that I, you know, would just do the job and just report it straight uh, when, you know, with, with what all that's going on. And I've talked to my colleagues and I, I watch, uh, especially the CBS Evening News, but I've got friends who work for all the networks, Fox, CNN, ABC, NBC. And I watch them, and I'd like to, to think that I would conduct myself the same way. Um, as a White House reporter, you really should be, and any kind of reporter, state house, city council, whatever. I mean, I came up starting covering local school boards in southern Illinois. Um, you know, you have to be as apolitical as you possibly can be. Um, there was a uh, famous TV guy back in, in the day who I, I'm not sure that anybody in here remembers, I think, maybe uh, Kristen and, and Bruce do, uh, David Brinkley, who said there's no such thing as objectivity, just varying degrees of subjectivity. Mm -hmm. So I, I hope that might answer your question. Any other questions? Mr. Zanka. So, so uh, I'm going to ask a proxy for these students here. What advice would you give to them on embarking on a career, if they think that this is something that they want to do, what should they be doing today and tomorrow and next week? Well, um, it, they're, they're doing the right thing right now by being here in this program, for one, for starters. Um, and I think they also need to start thinking, and I'm sure they are, of what they want to major in uh, in college. If, if you want to go into journalism, I would suggest uh, perhaps a double major. Uh, in journalism and political science, economics, uh, some the history, uh, well-rounded education, or perhaps maybe even more importantly to me, I, whoops, I wish I would have um, majored in perhaps something else and minored in journalism. I'd already had the advantage of doing a lot of on-the-job journalism by the time uh, I got to school. I was so lucky. But, uh, and also I think you, you need to be multi-platform people, which I know that uh, so many of you are. Uh, you know, you have to know about all different types of media now and, and be ready to, to know how to take pictures and post pictures and podcasting and uh, everything else that, that's out there now. It used to be uh, that you just would go into radio or TV or newspapers, but there's just so much more to it now. Uh, and I think that it's it's really important to, you know, to consider every single thing that's out there in terms of media. Yes. Um, you said that you could have your own opinions on political things and still be involved in communication. Like, I 
Southern examples of things that you don't have to do in Wisconsin? I'm sorry, the, the last part? Like, are there any examples of things that you wouldn't have to do in case you lived in Florida, like you could have your own ideas? I don't think so. Uh, the question was, can you have political opinions and uh, and use them in your reporting? Is that what you're saying? Or like, and still be involved in the communication here? Uh, you know, there, there's a sort of revolving door in Washington uh, for some people where they, you know, they work for politicians and then they uh, they go into maybe not reporting but being commentators on the air. I think that's some place where maybe you could pull it off. Um, I sure wouldn't like the idea of reporters doing that. Um, now there are some reporters who came up working for politicians and and ended up you know on the other side being straight reporters but to me they were always kind of suspect and uh, you know there were also a couple of instances of people who were reporters who became White House press secretaries um, one of them was a, a very uh, excellent White House press secretary uh, Tony Snow who had worked for Fox and uh, ended up uh, working for the second President Bush and that brings me to another lesson to share with you uh, it seems to me that in, any time I really got in trouble was when I made assumptions. And when Tony Snow was named uh, President Bush's press secretary, I thought, oh, here we go. Uh, he's going to turn the, uh, you know, the podium into like a, a TV show uh, and uh, you know, bring back some of his uh, like being a commentator on Fox and so forth. But he was a, a really uh, good press secretary who knew you know, to strike that balance between the boss and and uh, you know responding to reporters questions and and I think that he had uh, very good access sadly his time as press secretary was very much abbreviated because he had an um, awful health situation and and uh, died so but Tony was a really a, a fine press secretary but again watch it whenever you start making assumptions about people or issues because it can get you in trouble as a reporter or anything else in life I think so Yes. So there's a lot of talk about um, reporting places to lean more towards the left or more towards the right. How much did that impact your career in journalism? Can you can you explain just a little bit more about what you mean? So like when you're reporting for these places that people say lean, lean more towards the left or lean more towards the right, how does that impact how people viewed what you made and how you made what you made? Well, um, I always say that uh, you know s sometimes I'd get uh, complaints from people on both sides, and it always seemed to balance itself out. So that's when I thought, I, I guess I'm doing my job. Um, you just have to really hone yourself when you sit down at that keyboard or in front of the mic or before the camera to play it straight down the middle and uh, to, uh, to just tell the story as it is. Um, <clears throat> I'll share a story about a buddy of mine who was covering President Reagan. And President Reagan made a very famous statement, and this is just paraphrasing. This was during his first campaign in, in 1980. President Reagan said that uh, trees caused more pollution than cars. That uh, there was more pollution caused from natural sources than by cars. Well, his press secretary at the time, or I don't know if Jim Brady was a press secretary, but he was a campaign spokesman, uh, ran up and down the plane as they flew uh, flew back and he started yelling, killer trees, killer trees. <laughs> well, this friend of mine who was a very young reporter at the time, he was 22 years old and he was working for United Press International, he just couldn't figure out, you know, how, how am I going to cover this candidate for President of the United States saying that trees cause more pollution than cars? So he went to one of the senior experienced correspondents uh, another friend of mine, uh, Bill Plant from CBS, and he said, Mr. Plant, how should I cover this? And he said, just tell it straight. Just say exactly what Ronald Reagan said and just tell it straight. And, uh, and I think that's, it, it's a tough challenge, but you have to do it. And I'd like to think that I did. I, I never had any complaints, uh, uh, you know, major complaints. No one, uh, no editor, no producer ever told me to slant a story in a certain way. And you, you're going to find this hard to believe, but it, it, it really is the, the God's honest truth. Um, my closest friends uh, never knew if I did have any political thoughts or if I was going to vote for someone. Um, they had no idea exactly where I stood, and I didn't know where they stood. And that includes my very best friend in the world, who uh, he and I covered uh, politics together for 35, 40 years. So uh, 
it, it's a challenge, and uh, you just have to work on it to, to play it straight and right down the middle. In the White House press pool, you would have less <laughs> opportunity to tell the other side of the story to actually go interview the, the experts on trees and, and their pol the pollution they cause, or something like that. You, you would basically just be re reporting what President Well, no, you would, you would try your best okay. with the help of people back on your desk or colleagues who covered the environment or whatever that issue was, uh, to balance it out, to, to get, not necessarily opposing sides, but mm -hmm. to, to get uh, experts or, or others, you know, who would help put it into context, which is a, another, you know, really important thing to do is to, to put these stories into context. Um, but, you know, maybe the first, especially as a radio reporter, um, I had maybe 40 seconds at the most to do most of my stories because they would go into to five minute network newscasts. Uh, so maybe the first shot around it would be uh, President Bush said this and he spoke here and he's going on to there and then it was time to, to sign off. So where did I see a hand over here? Yes. I was on a two-part question. Um, in your own experience, what was the most challenging thing about being a reporter and what was the most rewarding? Um, the most rewarding was telling the story. I, I, from the time, I don't know why, it must be in my genes, nobody else in my family was in the news business, but to this day I still love to tell the story on Facebook or Twitter, uh, something like that, um, or to my long-suffering wife, did you <laughs> see this, you know? So telling the story and, 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 and assembling the story was always the, the most rewarding thing to do. Uh, the most challenging things were things like fighting um, uh, time differences, being on the other side of the world, or being um, in dangerous situations, um, those, those sorts of things uh, were challenging. And from a, a highly personal standpoint, uh, being away from my family as, as much as I was <coughs> from covering, uh, during the years of covering six presidents. Yes? Can you um, mentioned and encouraged all of us to seek different news sources. So what are some of the news sources that you use every day? Well, you know, thanks to being able to read things online, um, you know, it used to be when I worked for CBS, every day a courier, I mean, this, this is crazy when you stop and think about it, a courier would come over from the CBS News Bureau, and the courier would deliver the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Christian Science Monitor, um, you know, all the LA Times, all these different newspapers, the Washington Times, which, you know, is a, a conservative-leaning uh, editorial page, the, the journal, of course, with a conservative-leaning um, editorial and, and op-ed page. Uh, now, of course, online, uh, we can, and you should be reading everything. So I read everything. I look at, even to this day in retirement, you know, I look at everybody's websites, uh, reputable websites. Um, I don't really, you know, waste my time on a lot of trash, but unfortunately, a lot of times they are the motivating factors. Uh, so, you know, sometimes you will find yourself drifting to it. But everything uh, that I can watch and and uh, look at online, I find myself tiring of some of the uh, the cable TV people doing what we call the tin boogie. You know, just uh, <laughs> yakking and a bunch of people in boxes uh, talking and yelling at each other. But that's, that's, I hope that answers your question. So do you think that um, editorial and column pages have uh, an important place in the news? Editorial and, and oh, columnists? Yeah, like oh, I do. Um, it's, it's really, you know, like I, I quoted uh, Mr. Gerson. Um, I could, you know, just as easily quote uh, Dana Milbank of the Washington Post on the other side or uh, some of the, uh, you know, George Will, I read them all. It's, it's really, uh, you know, these people have the luxury, uh, Charles Krauthammer, you know, a lot of people come to mind. They have the luxury of, of sitting and thinking, and they're highly intelligent people, and they, uh, you know, use their life experiences to, uh, you know, to inform themselves uh, as they sit down to write these columns. I don't know how much influence anymore the editorial pages have, especially when it comes to endorsements. It used to be such a a huge thing, especially here, the union leader, who are they going to endorse in, in this primary? It was a huge, huge thing, and I, I guess as, as the state's leading paper, it, it still is. You should ask them about that when you go over there on Tuesday, uh, you know, how much, how much heft 
uh, they think they have and, and what goes into uh, to these endorsements. So yeah, it's, that's, a, that's a good one. Yes, sir. Um, so did you vote while you were in, uh, in your journalism? Like, and did you ever consider making that decision to affect your journalism? I did vote. I think that it's, uh, it's an obligation for all of us. I, you know, I voted in every election except no primaries. I, I, I did not vote in primaries because uh, that would be, uh, you know, declaring an allegiance to, to one party or the other. But uh, yes, I voted in every election. I have a colleague who made a big deal about not voting and saying that he thought it was wrong for reporters to vote. But you know, that's something that's sac sacrosanct. Uh, you know, nobody knows how I voted uh, through the years, but a terrific question. And, and uh, you know, to some reporters, a matter of debate. I only know of one, one guy who, who really prides himself in saying, I've never voted in an election. And I, I think it's almost sinful to not vote. Uh, you know, and I'd like to think that uh, that those of us who are reporters are, are pretty well informed uh, to vote. So yes, I I did vote. How do you how do you react to um, criticism from readers? From readers, um, you know, to be honest with you, um, it it would be it was pretty hard for them to get to, to, to where I was, you know, to to, to reach me. Um, so I, I didn't hear directly too often from any of them, and I, I can't remember a time when the, the White House complained uh, about, there were, you know, there were a couple times when we'd be in filing centers and someone would hear me reporting and they'd come over and say, you know, I can't believe you're saying that or something like that, some, someone from the press office. But I, you know, for better or worse, I, you know, there were very rare times that I really got much feedback, and that's just something that's part of the sort of the anonymity of radio. It's also uh, a testament to the quality of your reporting. Well, thank you. <laughs> but uh, thank you, Bruce. It, but so, you know, they couldn't put a face to it. Uh, you know, some of my TV colleagues probably would have a, a different uh, answer, uh, but I rarely heard back. One or two more questions, anyone? Yes, please. Mm -hmm. I'd like to peel to your human side for a moment. Um, what is the most valuable life lesson you've gained from your experiences that applies to your work? Uh, again, I would go back to um, my hometown, and uh, I think that that's one of the, the best lessons. I you know, had the advantage of growing up in a working class steel mill town. People were, almost all of them, you know, worked in factories, and, and there were a few who were farmers. And again, I always ask myself, you know, what is it that, that they'd want to know about this? Um, I don't know if that goes to your question or not, uh, but that it's just something that I, I repeat in every, every time I talk to, to groups <coughs> like all of you. Um, and I, again, I just think uh, to, uh, to put the sum of, of all of your life experiences and the way you were raised and so forth, it, again, there are varying degrees of uh, subjectivity and it's all formed by, by who we are. And it, it really becomes part of your reporting, and, and it should. So during the Nixon presidency, Nixon described you know, the Democrats as the opposition and the press as the enemy. So I mean, the idea of the press being the enemy of the president is not a new idea. But the degree seems to be, this seems to be a different degree, the vitriol that is thrown at the press. And what, and we're seeing increasing, increasingly, the trust in the press is diminishing. Th with that being said, does the press have an obligation? Does it have a duty to expressly defend itself, or or does it need to continue to just play straight? And this is what this is what is being said about us. I think it defends itself by doing its job and doing it straight and not allowing itself to be tarred as the opposition. And I think that there are some you know, recent polls, and we're going to have a session on polling, aren't we? And we can talk a little bit of more about this, uh, that show that, uh, the, you know, that the image of, re of reporting is edging up uh, in the face of all this. Look, this appeals to Donald Trump's base <coughs> to a certain extent. Uh, but I think that, that people are going to, to uh, beyond the base, and I think some of his base itself is going to grow weary of this. Maybe it's wishful thinking on my part. But um, 
it's it's you really summed it up beautifully. It's again to me, it's very troubling, very troubling what's going on now. Um, I I just read a story in the on the Times website, right, New York Times, right before we came over here, that Trump went back to talk to reporters on the the flight to France on on Air Force One, and they said that he was jovial and he you know that it was like a different guy, mm -hmm. and they said you know there's the TV Trump and then there's you know, there's this, some of them said there's a TV you Trump know, and there's this Trump. You know what's funny about that, Peter, is the first time he went back, I read an account of it, I read the pool report. The first time he went back, they did it off the record. They that is correct. His drive by. And it was kind of a drop by. And then it was so good that they came back and they said, oh, you can put it on the record. What ha yeah, what happened was, and, and I, I was going to save this, but you, Bruce brought it back to our rules of engagement uh, discussion. We can talk a little bit more about it. But the deputy press secretary, uh, uh, what's her name, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, came back and she said, the president's coming back, he's going to talk to you off the record. Uh, I have to tell you, this happened to me with every single president, and I hated it, and we'll talk more about it in that session. The president of the United States talking off the record, my goodness. But, so he, he the next day, Trump went up to a New York Times reporter and he said, why didn't you report what I said, you know, on the, on the plane? I think that's the way it played out. Uh, you know, did you use this quote or that quote? Or, uh, again, I wasn't there, obviously, and I'm not on the job, but she said, Mr. President, it was off the record. Your press secretary, no, put it on the record. I want it all on the record. So the White House had to produce a transcript uh, of what he did say because it's all recorded by the White House stenographers. So, yeah, it's uh, the rules of engagement are changing all the time with this <laughs> output. You know, if you're interested in, in looking at, at pool reports, you can Google White House pool reports, and there is a Twitter feed that gives you a live listing of all of them. Yeah. You can read them as they come out. It's very interesting. Yeah, you, you really should do it. Hey, great questions, and uh, there'll be a lot more in the next uh, few days. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. You have given us a brilliant start to our week, and I appreciate that. Thank you, thank uh, you. It's a serious topic, and I think that we're all up to it, and I'm looking forward. Thank you. And I know that there's some of you who had questions that were just, uh, you know, bubbling in your mind. So save them up. We can talk over lunch or whatever through the next few days. Thank you. Thanks a lot.